thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. What do you make of this extension now? Well, uh, obviously, uh, what we are seeing is more or less uh, an, up an, an avenue by the uh, federal government to possibly win more converts to this uh, land border crucial policy. But how sustainable that would be, uh, empirically, will be a mixture of uh, a lot of a lot of things. For one, for me anyway, it shows that the government itself is in dynamic as to what exactly to, to do. The action of the land border closure in itself is a response by the states to the local big business in Nigeria. Of course, under the prayer of global trade uh, uh, inhibitions that we are seeing, actually in the uh, actually after the global economic recession that happened in 2007. So we are seeing that kind of what we call in economist protectionism, an attempt to protect a local market for the purpose of sustaining our building on local production capacity. But it's not sustainable because we have entered into a, an, an era of globalization, so to speak. We have entered into an era where the entire world market is now more or less a global, a global village. So the, even if it's extended up to December 31st, 2020, it's not sustainable. Nigeria as a, as, a, as a prevalent economy, as an economy that feeds upon the world economy will be forced to reopen its, uh, its borders. May I remind you that the effect of the land border closure is all there for all to see. We are seeing the inefficiency of our own local uh, production capacity. We are seeing the fact that we, we have, uh, uh, in a way, uh, taking away a vital route for international trade and commerce. And there's no way Nigeria as a country can sustain on that, uh, on that basis. So well, it's going to be I, a continuation of uh, agony, tears, and sorrow. Well, couldn't we flip this on the head and say it's a good thing that we're now seeing some of the challenges that we face internally to get some of these, um, particularly rice that we've talked about. Isn't it something that would allow us to learn our mistakes and improve? Well, I don't, uh, I, I don't think so. I think uh, particularly that we are, the government is building skyscrapers in the sky. But when you talk about production, the first thing you need to get right in production, even as far back as the end of the Second World War, is the fact that you must have basic uh, power running. In an economy where power is in existence, I don't know where they, with what you want to produce the rice. Possibly they want to depend on, uh, on hair. But the fact is that you must have a viable power sector. You and, you and I know that Nigeria has one of the poorest power, uh, power supply in the world. In fact, running to almost behind Syria, according to Global uh, World Livable Cities Index of 2018, it has the worst power supply in, uh, indices in the world. So how do you want to sustain that uh, production? What we, are seeing is, what we are seeing practically is that we are seeing a glut in the local market, based on what the local producers are able to do. Now, they are particularizing rice now, for that matter. Possibly in that rice uh, market. Now, those producers want a window. They were able to force the Nigerian state to open a window of a period for them to uh, make some sales. But it's not sustainable. They will be forced to reopen our borders and the preparation is that the borders should be reopened. But what in the time in the time that it is closed, what are the possible economic ripple effect for us and our relationship with our neighboring countries? Because from what I hear, they are already grumbling. Very some well. of them are already saying we should boycott some product from Nigeria to let them know how offended we are by the clo border closure. Yeah, that, that's the ripple effect of protectionism, as I've as I've argued. It creates um, immigrant uh, phobia, as we have seen in Ghana, where uh, Nigerian traders, their shops are being closed by, by Ghanaians. Also in Benin Republic. Now, you have to understand the texture of uh, the West Africa market. West Africa, is, you know, you have the Anglophone West Africa, which is Nigeria and the rest, Ghana and the rest, and then you have the Francophone uh, West Africa. Now, some of those Francophone West African neighboring countries are dump sites uh, for French imperialist uh, goods. For instance, a country like Benin, 
almost everything in that country is being dumped by, by, by from across the sea by, by France and all that. Now, the ripple effect, the ripple effect is that what we are able to only achieve is we are able to create a, a little window for some local producers who don't have the capacity, whose uh, under barrier has now been exposed to the fact that we need to go back to the issue of capacity. And there's nothing about uh, you know being an isolated uh, who, uh, who has economy, squat, uh, economy. Okay. in a globalized uh, village. Uh, well, quickly before you go, um, there is a conversation about encouraging traders to go out and protest. Should they be protesting, and would it um, achieve any purpose? What we should be protesting about is the fact that the borders are closed. Number one, those borders have to be reopened. Then two is the fact that we need to have the economy, the actually the organs of, of even on the basis of capitalism, on the basis of, basis of the way production is being done. We need to have a viable power sector. We need to have all those things in place. And then we need, of course, the fact is that uh, for me, there's even no basis for borders between a country like ours and Africa, and right. uh, and, uh, and the Republic. Oh, we'll have to rest we need a borderless yeah. Africa and a borderless world where. Uh, trade and commerce can exist on a globalized level. Thank you very much. It's for a your pleasure thoughts. to be here. I appreciate Thank you. you so much.